O oh, solitude, if I must with thee dwell, let it not be among the jumbled heap of murky buildings. Climb with me the steep, nature's observatory, whence the dell, its flowery slopes, its river's crystal swell, may seem a span. Let me thy vigils keep amongst boughs pavilioned, where the deer's swift leap startles the wild bee from the foxglove bell. But though I'll gladly trace these scenes with thee, yet the sweet converse of an innocent mind, whose words are images of thoughts refined, is my soul's pleasure. And it sure must be almost the highest bliss of humankind, when to thy haunts two kindred spirits flee. Many people believe that muses can be embodied and that the embodied muse is able to stay with its artist for an extended period of time, years in some cases. But I believe that muses are by definition myths, and as Carl Jung has said, myths are well-known expressions of archetypes whose only form of communication is through images. Archetypes are first and foremost formless, unknowable, and amorphous. So the embodied muse is no longer a muse in the archetypal sense, which is an important distinction to keep in mind when discussing muses. I will talk today about the poetry of John Keats and his remarkably direct access to the muses as archetypes, which is evident in his poetry and in his own remarks about the nature of poetry and the role of the poet. In my opinion, his relationship with what some people call his muse, Fanny Braun, while lovely and romantic, had little to do with his real poetic work. As we know, the muses were said to have been the daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne. Since their mother's name translates roughly as memory, there is a suggestion that muses inspire in the artist a recollection rather than an invention of his or her art. They were nine in number, and they supported expressions in the visual arts, poetry, theater, dance, and the sciences. Muses are images emanating from the world of Greek mythology, which places them firmly in archetypal territory. In his essay, Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, Carl Jung defined archetypes as, quote, primordial universal images that have existed since the remotest times, unquote. Archetypes are ancient inherited psychic patterns contained within the unconscious and they are responsible for producing form and meaning in the human psyche. Jung says of them, quote, The archetype is essentially an unconscious content that is altered by becoming conscious and by being perceived. Formless, mysterious, and autonomous, archetypes reside in the unconscious, awaiting their formal turn on the stage of action in the conscious world. Jung believed that the artist's consciousness gave voice to creative psychic comprehension by projecting his or her own psychic dramas onto the events of nature, wherein the dance of archetypal imagery is most readily available to the sensitive artistic psyche. This is where the poetry of John Keats meets depth psychology, for Keats's poetry is profoundly archetypal in its ceaseless attention to nature, beauty, and truth. Indeed, in his poetry, Keats could not abstract beauty from truth. In a letter to his friend Benjamin Bailey dated November 22, 1817, Keats wrote, I am certain of nothing but of the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of the imagination. What the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth. This idea later appeared at the end of one of his most famous poems, Ode to a Grecian Urn, when the urn says to the reader, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. Like those of his contemporaries, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron, John Keats's poetry was all about extreme emotion expressed through the actions and events of the natural world and through the emphasis on sensual imagery packed with elements of beauty and the richness of nature's plenitudes. In his many famous letters, he left a wealth of information about his views on the social role of poetry and of his ideas about his poetic objectives. But perhaps his most astonishing axiom on poetry, as he named it, was his notion of negative capability, which is defined by scholars as, quote, a rejection of set philosophies and preconceived systems of nature. 
Keats demanded that the poet be receptive rather than searching for fact or reason, and to not seek absolute knowledge of every truth, mystery, or doubt. Here is proof that Keats was able to allow archetypes to remain archetypes. The practice of negative capability required a continuous rejection of mental time traveling, and Keats the poet maintained a ferocious allegiance to the present moment. In another letter, he said, I scarcely remember counting upon any happiness. I look not for it if it be not in the present hour. Nothing startles me beyond the present moment. The setting sun will always set me to rights, or if a sparrow come before my window, I take part in its existence and pick about the gravel. He believed that the poet could only access true poetry by remaining within the mystery of total immediate experience, unhindered by thought or reason. He said, quote, Poetry should be unobtrusive, a thing which enters into one's soul and does not startle it. If poetry does not come as naturally as the leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all. It is not surprising, therefore, that Keats was able to give beautiful voice to the archetypes that swam around in his consciousness. Archetypes are, most of all, amorphous, unknowable, ungraspable, and mysterious. Therefore, only the poet or artist who respects and admires the mysterious for itself can access and express the infinite creative potentialities of archetypes. The artist who tries to possess and hold and know the mysterious inevitably loses the thread of the archetype, and the work suffers by losing the liminality and the numinosity which typically accompanies visionary and archetypal art. Muses are myths, and myths are the imaginal expressions of archetypes, and as such they have a further role in the growth of artistic consciousness and its imaginal products. Jung says something incredible about a process by which an archetype, often with a quote, cunning play of illusions lures into life the inertness of matter that does not want to live. He says that the archetype, quote, makes us believe incredible things so that life may be lived. There is a suggestion here that consciousness would rather not exist and that without archetypes pulling upon it, it would not exist. Jung further states that archetypes, quote, are meant to attract, to convince, to fascinate, and to overpower. With their siren songs, they compel consciousness into being. Furthermore, the archetype is autonomous. Quote, it lives of itself. It is a life behind consciousness that cannot be completely integrated with it, but from which, on the contrary, consciousness arises. We can conclude, therefore, that muses are not so much called upon, embodied, encountered by chance, or even through a lucky set of circumstances, but rather they are, along with other archetypes, the very force by which consciousness itself is drawn into being. Art is an expression of consciousness, after all, and I am suggesting that without the archetypal energies of the muses as archetypes, not only would there, be, not, only would there not be any art, there would not be any consciousness. According to Jung, the unconscious is inherently creative, and we can see that every archetype ultimately has a creative imperative which seeks expression. This is the role of the poet, and to this purest archetypal imperative, John Keats was absolutely true. Here is the last stanza from Ode to Psyche. Yes, I will be thy priest, and build a fane in some untrodden region of my mind, where branched thoughts new-grown with pleasant pain instead of pines shall murmur in the wind. Far, far around shall those dark clustered trees fledge the wild ridged mountains steep by steep, and there by zephyrs, streams, and birds and bees the moss-lane dryads shall be lulled to sleep. And in the midst of this wide quietness, a rosy sanctuary will I dress, with the wreathed trellis of a working brain, with buds and bells and stars without a name, with all the gardener fancy e'er could feign, who breeding flowers will never breed the same, and there shall be for thee all soft delight that shadowy thought can win, a bright torch and a casement ope at night to let the warm love in. Some people attribute the immense productivity of John Keats's last few years on earth to his love relationship with Fanny Braun. 
It is tempting to attribute increased creativity to the presence and influence of a beloved and beautiful personage, but I get the sense that real creativity comes from the ungraspable realm of archetypes who cannot be embodied or directly accessed. All the ingenuity and maturity of Keats's later work was already on display prior to his meeting Fanny, and in his own words we can discern a total commitment to his craft. Quote, I find I can have no enjoyment in the world but continual drinking of knowledge. I find there is no worthy pursuit but the idea of doing some good. There is but one way for me. The road lies through application, study, and thought. Scholars are continually remarking on how rapidly he matured as an artist. He published his work for only four years and was only 25 years old when he died. Even the poem Bright Star, which is made much of in the romanticization of their relationship, was originally composed for another woman and rewritten for Fanny as a declaration of love. In fact, Keats was still reworking the poem as late as his last journey to Italy, where he went ostensibly to recuperate from terminal tuberculosis, but in reality he ended up dying there. While I do not doubt their love as romantic partners, I question whether his productivity or even the content of his work can be attributed in any way to his relationship with Fanny Braun, which lasted from the summer of 1818 through the fall of 1820, not even two years. There is a tendency to place a good deal of emphasis on the relationship of an embodied muse with an actual artist, and historically it is almost always the male artist who is inspired by his female muse. Indeed, the muses themselves are portrayed as young women whose beauty and grace are so overpowering they inevitably bring the affected artist into contact with hitherto inaccessible reservoirs of creativity. I personally find this idea problematic because of the gender divide. There is a suspicious level of male sexual desire in this equation to make it plausible. Also, when looking through histories of well-known artist-muse pairs, one is struck by how boring and repetitive the available material is. It's always the same bunch with the same information about their relationships, which are almost always romantic in nature. To me, this says that there is nothing archetypal about any of it, and that it's yet another example of how unknowable mysteries are inevitably given the anthropocentric treatment we humans give to everything. As the boundless beauty of his poetry clearly suggests, John Keats was a visionary romantic poet who remained in direct contact with the archetypes of the unconscious as they came to him in the form of beauty and love through the direct experience of nature's infinite creative profundity. His work is a clear indication of how muses are not only useful but crucial to artists of all ages, so long as they are understood and interacted with as archetypes. They are mysterious, liminal, numinous, ungraspable, overpowering, terrifying, and unknowable sources of inspiration and creativity. They are the bridge to the essence of art, and in this essential form, art is sudden, explosive, natural, and true. As the ultimate soul-maker, Keats remains at the vanguard of archetypal English poetry, which is, as Jung has said, rooted in the immensity of the unconscious. On his deathbed, Keats requested that his tombstone bear no name or date, but only the inscription, Here lies one whose name was written in water. Naturally, his friends couldn't be as sublime as he himself was, so they inscribed petty bitterness on his tombstone, but that's a story for another time. Thankfully, Keats himself has the last word over all the snobby critics who derided his low birth and education. No one remembers them. While Keats's star shines brighter with every passing year, continually shedding a bright light on the ultimate romance in human existence, the love dance between archetypes and consciousness. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite. The moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. <laughs>